Within this section, we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of C. difficile infection, focusing on germination or the conversion from the spore phase to the vegetative phase within the small bowel, shifts in colonization resistance that occur in the large bowel, and then finally we'll talk about the toxins, toxin A and toxin B, and how they attack our colon and result in the most common diarrheal syndrome of C. difficile infection. As we think back to our textbook years, we will remember that there are two main primary bile salts, cholate and chenodeoxycholate. Cholate enhances germination and is an upswitch for germination, whereas chenodeoxycholate is an inhibitor of germination. Cholate and chenodeoxycholate, as they traverse the bowel and pass through the small bowel and into the colon, are converted from being a primary bile salt to a secondary bile salt. Cholate becomes deoxycholate, chenodeoxycholate becomes lithocholate. It turns out that the enzyme that stimulates that conversion is 7-dehydroxylase, and that is released by another bacteria, C. sindens. The two secondary bile salts, deoxycholate and lithocholate, inhibit the vegetative phase of C. difficile. In patients with C. difficile infection, there is an overabundance of cholate favoring germination, and there is less chenodeoxycholate inhibiting germination. There also is a depletion of C. sindens. Therefore, there's less of the secondary bile salts that inhibit the vegetative phase. So the bile salt milieu actually plays a really important role in the development of C. difficile infection. What about shifts in the microbiota? And these are the classic explanation for the development of C. difficile infection. And the landmark study that looked into this was a study by Chang et al. Chang looked at 10 individuals. Three of those individuals were control individuals. They had no C. difficile infection. They were over 65 with no oncologic diagnosis. Four individuals had an initial C. difficile infection and three had recurrent C. difficile. They compared the diversity of the microbiota as well as the constituency of the microbiota. And when they compared no infection with initial infection, there were no statistically significant differences in the constituency or the diversity. Whereas when they compared initial infection with recurrent infection, there were statistically significant differences with a depletion of the colonization resistance and diversity in those with recurrent C. difficile. In addition, there was a depletion in the preponderance of Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes in those with recurrent C. difficile. So it's believed that the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes play an essential role in the development of this infection. What about how C. difficile attacks us? And this slide shows the gene loci for the proteins involved in the pathophysiology of C. difficile's attack. I will point your attention to TCDA and TCDB. These code for toxins A and toxin B. Toxin A is an enterotoxin. Toxin B is a cytotoxin. TCDC is an inhibitor protein of toxins A and toxin B. So it inhibits the production of toxin A and toxin B. Why is this clinically relevant? It turns out that a mutation to TCDC results in the NAP1BI027 strain, the so-called hypervirulent strain. The logical reason for this is by inhibiting a protein that inhibits production of toxin A and toxin B, you get more toxin A and toxin B. TCDR is an enhancer of toxin A and toxin B, and TCDE is involved in membrane lysis and involved in the attack of C. difficile. Let's focus a little bit more on toxin B or TCDB. And there are three regions to this protein. There's the receptor binding region, there's the hydrophobic region, and then there's the glucosyl transferase region. When this toxin attacks the colonocyte, it binds onto the epithelium receptor. It then gets internalized and forms an endosome. Within that endosome, an acidic environment develops. That acidic environment 
causes perforations around the periphery of the endosome, resulting in toxin B becoming a transmembranal protein with the hydrophobic region forming the bridge. There is then a conformational change of the protein, glucosyl transferase is released into the cytosol. Once it's in the cytosol, it binds onto a rho protein with a conserved threonine residue. That ultimately inhibits the development of actin filaments in the cytoskeleton. Ultimately, the cytoskeleton demolishes the cell lysis. With cell death, there is more distance between the colonocytes, more fluid flows into the colon, and ultimately patients develop diarrhea. By having a better understanding of the germination process, as well as shifts in colonization resistance and how C. difficile attacks our body, you as a practitioner will have a better understanding of how to best treat your patients optimally and what is the most appropriate treatment for patients that have both initial infection as well as recurrent infection.